So who do we have on for today? Well, our good friend, Russell Gray. I can't wait. As you guys know, we travel a lot together. We meet them down in Belize. We've been on their cruises. They have syndication and goal seminars and all kinds of cool stuff. And it's going to be fun to see what Russ has to say today. Yeah, definitely. And for those that don't know him, what does Russ do? So Russ is one of the partners and one of the co-hosts of the Real Estate Guys. And they're a radio show they've been around for, um, I'll let him say, but I know it's been probably a good 20 years. And they've been partners. He's partners with Robert Helms. And uh, they are uh, big, big fans of Rich Dad and the advisors and education and and very connected uh, nationally and internationally. So what do you think you want to talk to him about today? Well, I want to talk to him about some of what's going on uh, in the different cities because, yeah. you know, what we're seeing is we're seeing migration patterns as a result of public policy. So uh, that's kind of where I want to focus. Well, and I know that he, I was looking at his bio and he knows a lot about inflation and deflation yeah. and stagflation. And I feel like we haven't had a guest on yet that's done a good job of explaining. We've tried. It We've just, tried. We always ask, better. We always ask like what's stagflation. And I feel like some of our guests have dodged it or haven't answered it fully. So I'm excited to ask him about yeah, that. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, everybody, it's Ken here. I'm with Daniil. Hello. So we're excited about our guest today, Russ Gray. He is co-host of the Real Estate Guys. They're radio guys. They've been doing this business for a long, long time, way before YouTube, way before the Internet. They've been on the radio. They were the first, like, influencers. Yeah, for sure, for real estate. Uh, At one time, I don't know, I'll let Russ say, they, uh, they, they were the most downloaded on Apple podcast. So they, um, they've been in the business a long, long time. I'm excited to have them on. Welcome, Russ. Well, thanks for having me. Yep. I am definitely part of the old guard now. <laughs> Getting used to it. Robert started the show in 1997. Uh, I started uh, partnering with him, working on stuff together in 2001, 2004. I became the co-host temporary. And I've been the temporary co-host ever since. So can't get rid of me. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, you guys are a great match. You know, uh, Robert is, I would say, more of the traditional radio host. He's got that, you know, radio voice and and it's really deep. And and, and, uh, I love how he leans on you for all the data, you know, which I love talking to you about. And you're so good at that. I remember we were watching um, you with so many guests, but uh, I remember you you having an incredible dialogue with Ed Griffith about, you know, the creature from Jekyll Island and, and, you know, obviously we're big fans of Ed and uh, just digging into all the things that he's writing about with the federal reserve and the inflation and deflation and how it's all kind of prescripted pretty much. Right. So, so what do you have to say about that? Let's jump right in on inflation, deflation, and some of the things that Daniel was talking about. Where do you, where do you think we're headed? Well, you know, people ask all the time, uh, you know, are we going to have inflation or are we going to have deflation? And I say, yes, I think we're going to have both. And I think we can have both at the same time. And people have a hard time getting their mind around that because they only know how to think of numbers in terms of the dollar. And yet, you know, if you look at things like real interest rates versus nominal rates, or you look at real wages versus nominal wages, and, you know, not to get wonky or anything, but basically nominal is just a number. So it's a number. It, it, you know, you and I are old enough to remember where if you made 50000 or or $100,000 a year, you were upper middle class. That was a good income. Well, it's not that way anymore. I read an article the other day that, you know, lower middle class just to scrape by in San Francisco is $300,000 a year. Well, it's not, it's not that the lifestyle got so much better or the work became so much more valuable. It's that the dollar that you're paying for it all went down. So in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your purchasing power, you deflate it. You lost the ability to purchase. And yet in terms of the nominal, the amount of dollars actually coming in, flowing through your hands, the numbers went up. And you see that with your tenants. Your tenants might be paying more rent and earning more wages, but they're getting smaller places and they're having to pay more for their cost of living. They, they're, they're struggling. I mean, it's really, I mean, you probably know a lot more about it than me, just managing your portfolio of tenants. But you know, gas and food and, and healthcare, uh, everything has gone up. At college tuition, you know, when you get to that stage in life, raising children, I mean, just everything costs more. And even though your wages are up, your cost of living is up more. And it's interesting, you know, because they try to the news and everything tries to tell you that 
it's temporary or that it's not that bad. And then, you know, all of us Americans, I mean, we see it every time we fill up our gas tank, every time we go to the grocery store, every time we do anything. I mean, everything's just going up. Well, the thing is, it's been going on for a long time. And I, I talked about this at our last investor summit. Uh, when I, I don't think you were there, Kenny. You hadn't arrived yet, but I, I dressed up as Greybeard the pirate. And I did my whole presentation in full pirate garb. And it was the kickoff presentation for the summit. I really wanted people to kind of understand what was going on, how the financial system evolved from where gold and silver were money and the paper were claims on that money. In other words, you could turn the coupon in, the dollar, the paper currency in to get the metal. And metal was money. Somewhere along the line, the system changed and the currency became the money. In other words, the unit of measure, a dollar was a specific amount of silver. And then all of a sudden, a dollar went to being its own asset all by itself, not really indexed to anything. So the unit of measure became the money. And I kind of went through that whole evolution to help people understand that the system itself is flawed. And that's the core problem. We borrow our money into existence. I think we were all together many years ago when uh, Robert Kiyosaki did a event talking about gold, had Mike Maloney out. And Mike was explaining how we borrow our money into existence. And so because we do that, we have to repay all of the principal plus the interest, but there is no currency to pay the interest. So you have to go borrow more money. It's a cycle of perpetual debt. So it doesn't matter what the politicians say. It doesn't matter about the debt ceiling. They just raise it and they really want to just eliminate it. If they were to pay off the debt, they would eliminate all of the money and the system would collapse. It's the dirty little secret nobody wants to talk about. Can and you so they, explain that? If they if they pay off all the debt, the currency would collapse. Yeah. So imagine if we were going to sit down and play the game of cash flow or monopoly and you start out and the banker gives everybody a certain amount of money to start the game and then it circulates. Uh, and so imagine if the three of us were playing a game and there were, each of us had a million dollars. And so there's $3 million in circulation. And let's say the interest rate, let's say, let's say if we just started that and we just issued the money, then the money would have no interest attached to it unless we lent amongst each other. But what if in the game, the banker lent you the money? In other words, the money didn't exist until it got borrowed. It gets borrowed into existence. So let's say the interest rate is 10%, just to keep the math easy. At the end of a year, you need $3 million of principal to pay off the debt plus $300,000 of interest. But how much money did we create? Only $3 million. So the only way to get the interest, the $300,000, is to borrow it into existence so we can pay the interest. And now we owe interest on the interest that we borrowed and it compounds. And that's why the debt just continues to compound, has ever since they founded the Federal Reserve and created this system in 1913. And I think if you really look at what's going on, we're at the end game. Interest rates got reset in the 80s all the way up to over 20%. And we're going systematically down. I mean, it was jagged, it would go up and down, but basically downward trend all the way till it hit the zero bound coming out of the great financial crisis. Well, once interest rates hit to zero, you know, where do you go from there? And if you want to kind of talk about where interest rate policy is, why Peter Schiff, our mutual friend Peter Schiff says the Fed is in a monetary Roche Motel, can't get out of it, we can go there. But fundamentally, the system is flawed because if you were to pay off the debt, you would eliminate all of the money because all of it is debt. If you look at the dollars in your, in your wallet, they say Federal Reserve note. A note is a debt. It used to be a certificate redeemable for gold and silver. And in, in that fact, presentation. yeah, in fact, they used to have silver certificates and gold certificates. So if you go back and Google it, it's actually literally printed on them. Yeah, exactly. And, and I actually I have some of those and I keep them as souvenirs and I like to show people they look exactly the same. They do. And in that presentation they did on the summit, I showed really how we went from having gold and then cert certificates that were redeemable for gold to notes that look just like the certificates, but we went from money to debt. And when the system flipped over and became debt, it became profitable not to save. You know, Kiyosaki says all the time, savers are losers when the system became debt. When the system became debt, the people who win are borrowers. And that's why real estate is the asset class to be in in this type of an environment. I, I remember, uh, you know, meeting with Mike Maloney and um, 
him saying, you know, you just got to follow. He said in the history of the world, over 2000 currencies have never survived. Not one. They've all basically been what he calls fiat currency, what a lot of people call fiat currency. They basically go until they don't exist anymore. And, and so one of the things he brought was a gold coin. He said, you see these edges on the, ed uh, on the gold coins. Back in the day, they used to shave the edges. So they'd get a gold coin, they'd shave the edge. They'd get a gold coin, they'd shave the edge or the silver. And the, co the coins would get, be getting smaller and smaller and smaller as they became circulated. That's why they put the edges on them. Oh, interesting. And then it moved to the gold certificate, the silver certificate, and then they dropped those words, and then it was tied to gold, and now it's not tied to gold, right? So that's been kind of the evolution. Yeah, and the modern-day version of that is shrinkflation. When you go in and buy a box of cereal that used to have 16 ounces in it, now it has 12, and you're paying the same price. And so it feels like prices haven't gone up, but in fact, they have. And it's the same same concept. The other thing you have to understand is that as an entrepreneur, I mean, I know you know this, you get up every day and you think about how to make strategic investments, technology, training, so that you operate more efficiently and you reduce your costs to do. You negotiate better contracts, you create alliances, uh, purchasing alliances, whatever you can do to drive costs down. And then you take that extra profit and you spread it out to your employees. I know MC companies is one of the best places in Arizona to work and you take care of your people. You also continue to make those strategic investments in better systems, better processes, and greater efficiency. You lower your prices to your customers to attract more market share. All of those things go on. Those are productivity gains. And when you have a Federal Reserve whose policy is to maintain prices up and create inflation, they're going to print as much money as it takes to suck up all of those productivity gains and then make the price actually go up. And so you say, well, I don't see the prices going up. And so people think this inflation that we're experiencing now that we see the prices going up is a new phenomenon. But this has actually been going on for quite a while. It's just that we've been stealing the productivity gains and now we've eaten all those up. And now the actual inflation is coming out above the surface where people can actually see and feel it. And they've got a big problem because people are upset about it. So can you break it down for me what so we understand what inflation and deflation is, but what is stagflation? Because that's where uh, I start to get confused. Yeah, that's perfect. So stagflation is where you have nominal growth, where the numbers get bigger, but the, the actual productivity goes down. And the way I explain it is if you had, uh, say, an economy that was producing or a business that was producing a million widgets at $100 a widget, then you'd have a $100 million company. And let's say you needed 10,000 employees to do that. Um, and that means each employee creates, what, 100 widgets you know, a year or whatever the number is, whatever their productivity is. But now because of inflation, you actually have to sell those widgets at $108 or $120. I'm sorry, $120. So now you'd say, well, if I sold a million dollar widgets at $120 million company, but I lose some market share when I raise the price. Some people can't afford the 120. So now I'm only selling 900. Well, if you do the math, and this is coming right out of the presentation I did on the summit, if you do the math, the 900 times 120 is 108 million. So in other words, your company has grown nominally by 8% because of 20% inflation. Your price went up from $100 a widget to 120. You sold 10% less widgets. But when you do the math, your sales in terms of numbers, nominal dollars, went up 8%. So you look like you grew. But based on the same level of productivity, you need 10% less people. So you lay off 100 or 1,000 people. Now you only need 9,000 employees instead of 10,000. And so, and instead of selling a million widgets, you're only selling 900,000 widgets. So what the world got in the real in the real world, what the real world got was less jobs and less products. And yet it looks like the business grew. That's stagflation. When the numbers go up, but the supply goes down and the economic activity goes down. And that's how inflation distorts what's going on. It's very hard as an investor. It's very hard as a business person to know what to do in that kind of an environment. Oh, I love that. That was a really good explanation. It was. So how does that, when you look at today's economy, what do you see? Do you think we're in stagflation? 
Well, uh, you know, it, it, part of it is th these guys that are are trying to reset the system. And I don't think that that's a conspiracy theory. I think it's pretty well known that, you know, Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum have been meeting and they've all been talking about the Great Reset. Uh, our mutual friend Jim Rickards uh, wrote his whole series, starting with currency wars and talked about the, the reset from the dollar as the world's, world's reserve currency to the uh International Monetary Fund's special drawing rights or SDRs. Uh, there's been some talk about trying to get back onto a gold standard. Not sure that'll ever happen. The world is going, you know, with Bitcoin. So you've got all these different dynamics uh, going on. And so the, the question is, is, is if, if the currency is going to reset, then you've got to have some cover. In other words, again, I'm a little bit older than you, Kenny, but you're probably old enough to remember in the 70s when we the last time we had stagflation, that was the result of the Nixon shock. 1971, August 15th, 1971, Nixon defaulted on the gold standard. U.S. dollars were no longer redeemable for gold. We, we defaulted. The dollar crashed. Gold went from $42 an ounce up to $850 an ounce. Oil went through the roof. And they had to reset everything. That's when we opened up trade relationships with China, started exporting our uh, labor. A lot of the problems we have today were all rooted in that great reset. Okay. So when, when you think about that, the, the cover that we had, we were told back then, see if this script sounds familiar to you, we were told that we were going to run out of fossil fuels by the year 2000. And there was this uh, big problem in the Middle East that meant that uh, we had a big oil shortage. Okay. So the, the, the supply chain of oil was the reason why prices were going up. It had nothing to do with the dollar collapsing. Oh, no, 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 no. It was, <laughs> it was about the supply chain. We were also told that there was an existential threat that the world by the 21st century was going to be in a new ice age. You can look all this stuff up, right? I remember the long lines. As a kid, I remember we, we wait in line for gas. Yeah, the, the, every other day, odd even days, and you could only get five gallons or five dollars or yeah. whatever it was. I mean, I, w I was actually a Robert and I joke because we're about the same age, and we were both petroleum transfer agents, we're both gas station attendants. Uh, you know, at that at that time, we oh, watched wow. all that happen. Okay, so so you had you had the uh, the oil crisis, you had the climate crisis, and then we had the swine flu and later AIDS. We had the existential disease crisis. Does any of that sound at all familiar to you? <laughs> right, that sounds yeah. familiar. Yeah. Yeah, they run the same playbook. And so to me, I mean, I'm not saying that the diseases weren't real. People died from AIDS. People died from swine flu. But it wasn't an existential crisis. I, I, I think COVID is real. Do I think it's an existential crisis? No, I don't see people dropping dead. I, 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 I know people that have gotten it. I know people that have died from it. I'm not saying it's not real. I'm just saying it's not an existential threat. I think the whole climate change thing is beginning to be called into question. First, it was global cooling. Then it was global warming. Now it's just climate change. Right. I'm suspicious they of all that. They gave up uh, trying to predict which one it'll be. Yeah. I mean, you know, my, my, my partner, Robert, says all the time, experts predict interest rates will either rise or fall. <laughs> <laughs> I well, mean, you've got to find a way to be on either side of the fence. So um, obviously, uh, our good friend George Gammon. We had a we had some uh, discussions with him, and uh, you know he was one that opened my eyes to the fact that you can have deflation and inflation going at the same time. And, and he said it's they're both pushing and pulling, and it's just which which one's uh, doing it harder. So um, and, and he he said you know just take a look at. Like anything that you buy that deflates right away, it doesn't matter. It could be a cell phone, it could be a TV. That's those are deflationary things. Period. Then there's other things that are inflating at the same time. So that was a pretty good um, uh, uh, analysis. Uh, you you know when I, when I asked him that. Yeah, definitely. Go ahead. Do you think that? Um you know, the the Fed came out yesterday, I think it was, and said that they're probably going to raise interest rates maybe three times during 2022. And that's going to, you know, obviously spike up unemployment because it is going to create like less borrowing and the movement of money. Um, do you think that we're probably in for some pain up ahead? Because so far it's been all fun, right? Everybody has more money than they've ever had, more savings than they've ever had. And it's kind of like people like us are just waiting for the next um, you know, brick to fall. It's fun for people who have assets on their balance sheet that benefit from inflation. 
if you have commodities, real estate, stocks, if you have those things on your balance sheet, it's been fun. If you sell products and services to customers who have that kind of wealth effect, it's been fun. If you're Main Street USA and you're working a job uh, and you're paying twice as much for gas and twice as much for food, it's no fun at all. Yeah. So inflation and deflation occur simultaneously uh, in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your balance sheet. Uh, both of the th things are happening. As far as the Fed goes, um, I, I've got to agree with Peter Schiff. I had a chance to uh, talk about being an you know, getting in over your head. I, I, I made a vow after 2008 to always be the dumbest person in the room. And so I, I, you know, continually upped who I hang out with and stretched myself and it's been great, but every once in a while you find yourself in these situations, you know, way back in 2012, <laughs> the very first summit that Kiyosaki came on, I ended up on that panel seated between Robert Kiyosaki and G Edward Griffin to talk about the fed. I, I was just so in over my head at the last new Orleans investment conference, Brian London put me on a panel with Jim Rickards and Daniel Martino. <laughs> Oh, and I'm wow. like, oh my God, Adam, please. Adam Taggart uh, was, was the moderator. Please don't ask me a question. But I have a very simplistic way I look at the, the situation with the Fed. And it really grew out of my, my study because I got destroyed in 2008. And I found out the hard way that ignorant of the ignorance of the financial system can be deadly. And I was very, very dependent upon healthy credit markets, which I did not understand at all. And the short of it is, is that bonds are both simultaneously an asset and a liability. They're an asset to the person who lent the money and owns the bond, and they're a liability to the person who borrowed the money and issued the bond. Well, bonds are priced just like apartment buildings. And so when cap rates go down, that basically means that values on apartments have gone up. People are bidding more for the same income. When interest rates or yields on bonds go down, it means the face, the, the market value, the principal value of the bond goes up, just like apartments. The challenge is, is we've issued trillions of dollars of bonds in a zero interest rate environment. And if we raise interest rates, the, the asset price of those bonds collapses. And that's one level of pain. Now, you can imagine if you had a portfolio of real estate, apartment buildings, and all of a sudden somebody just could manipulate cap rates up, right? As a buyer, you'd be like, oh, that's great. But as a seller, I mean, as an owner, that would be bad. Now, let's imagine you have debt on those apartment buildings. Okay. In the real estate world, eh, that, that's inconvenient. You watch your equity go away. But you know, as long as you can make the cash flow, you can ride it out. But in the bond world, if you borrow against your bonds, which goes on all the time, it's called hypothecation, then what ends up happening is those bond values collapse and you get a margin call. And that's what happened in 2008. Just a small number of subprime borrowers ended up defaulting. And normally that the system would have been able to absorb that. But what ended up happening is it, it collapsed the value of the bonds that those subprime mortgages had been sold into mortgage-backed securities. And then Wall Street had levered those up with derivatives. And so when that, that bond collapsed, it created a chain reaction of collapsing prices and cash calls. And, and so it may seem a little complex. If people want to learn more about it, I can tell you the book that explained it to me the best was a book called All the Devils Are Here by Bethany McLean. It's probably about 15 years old now, maybe 13 years old, a really, really good book. But we've created more bonds, we've created more derivatives than ever before. There's like something like 250 quadrillion, it's a huge number <laughs> of, of, of derivatives in the financial system globally. If interest rates were to go up, those bond values and all those derivatives collapse and it would take the financial system with it. So the Fed has a choice to make. Do we save the system, which is our monopoly, or do we save the dollar? Yeah. And I think that they're going to save the system. They will sacrifice the dollar and attempt to replace it with something else. And that's the thing I think that American investors who are among in the entire world, we're the only group of people that don't think in dual currencies. Everybody thinks in their home currency plus the dollar. But Americans only think in the dollar. We're the least prepared if the dollar were to lose its status as a reserve currency. And that's why I think the reset is so important to the elites right now trying to get that in place. So let's let's so, well, real quick, though. So you think that the Fed, even though they said they're going to raise rates, you don't think they're going to because it would sacrifice the system? Yeah, I don't think they can. That's yeah. the monetary roach motel that Peter Schiff says they're in. They jawbone. They talk about it. I mean, even the taper 
you know, they so far they haven't tapered. They've just said they're going to taper and they're yeah. going to accelerate so, the taper. So let's and, talk about that real quick. First of all, um, we jumped right into bonds. Can you explain what a bond is? Yeah, a bond, a bond is an IOU. Right. So, you know, if, if your audience are primarily real estate people, then just think of it as a mortgage. Mortgage is simultaneously somebody's obligation and somebody else's asset. So if you're the mortgage maker, meaning you wrote the mortgage, you created the promissory note, uh, which is your bond, your promise to pay, then you owe it. And it's a liability on your balance sheet. And the person and who lent you the money, it's an asset to them. Right. And so let's, uh, so it's interesting because George said, um, don't look at the stock market, follow the bond market. Absolutely. So, and, and, and I'll, I think that from a marketing standpoint, everybody's focused on the stock market, but the professionals are focused on the bond market. And, and so one of the things when you said taper, let me just back up and explain what you were saying. The fed started buying bonds and this is why George is actually suing the Fed with Robert Barnes is um, because the, the Fed has been buying bonds and he said it's against their charter. So um, can you walk us through that a little bit? Because when you talk about taper, what you're really saying is the Fed said we're going to start start tapering off buying bonds and and eventually raise interest rates next year. That's publicly what they've said so far. Uh, it, did I get that right? Yeah. So what, what happens is the Fed doesn't actually control interest rates. They manipulate them and they manipulate them through their open market committee, the Fed open market committee. You'll hear those initials FOMC, the FOMC meeting. And then they set policy. They set a target. They say, well, we're going to target this rate. Well, how do they actually manipulate the market? They step into the market as a bidder. They're either a seller or a buyer of bonds. What kind of bonds? Treasuries primarily treasuries. Now they expanded after the financial crisis in 2008 into mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and so right now, and probably for the last 10 or 12 years, every single month, they purchase $80 billion in US bonds, which is a trillion dollars a year of government debt they purchase. And it will lend to the government, if you will. And they purchase $40 billion a month or $480 billion a year of mortgage-backed securities, which is a direct lifeline or a main line of Fed printed money into the, into the real estate. They're very committed to keeping real estate prices up uh, because the real estate, the, the mortgages that get converted into or pulled together into mortgage-backed securities make up a big chunk of the bond market. If real estate prices were to collapse uh, as they did, then it takes the bond market with it. And that's what happened in 2008. And so to prevent that, they have to keep the prices up. And so that's why real estate is such a great place to be because you're not fighting the Fed, you're going with their flow. I feel badly for the people who can't play the game, but for those of us that can, it's fantastic. Okay, but so that's, that's what the Fed has been doing. So it's an injection of $120 billion a month of freshly printed money that they put directly into the system. They put it directly into real estate, uh, by by making it available to, to the lending channels. And then they put it directly into circulation by lending it to the government who then spends it. So before we jump to the next piece, because this is exactly what I, I thought you were going to say. So this is why most people think the stock market is propped up and the real estate market is propped up. It's because of what the Fed's doing right now. And the Fed has also said that they're going to taper this off. Is that right? Yeah. And the tapering is, is just saying, okay, we're going to continue to pump money in. We're just going to slow down how much right. we're pumping in. In other words, we we've been blowing up this balloon and we feel like the balloon is like really, really big right now. And so we got it. We want it to get bigger, but we got to slow down because at the rate we're going, we're afraid it's going to pop and they're stuck because if they slow down and the marketplace doesn't step in to replace them in terms of purchasing those bonds and keeping the bid up then the yields will will rise okay and so again coming back to apartments because that's something that i think a lot of the people that follow you kenny will understand is that the more people bidding on an apartment bid it up which right. means they bid the cap rate down bond market is exactly the same the more people bidding up the price of the bond they bring down the yield. When the Fed steps into the market as a buyer, they bid up 
and they drive yields down. When they taper, they step out of the market as a buyer, and they're doing a little bit to see if the market will step up. If the market doesn't, then the Fed is going to have to step back in and pump it back up, because if they don't, the interest rates are going to rise, and then the house of cards collapses. So I understand how they pump money into the stock market, right? Because that doesn't really take much effort. You just throw money in and, and get some stock. But how do they pump money into the real estate market? Because it's not like they're buying homes or anything like that, or are they? Well, technically, they're not even buying stocks, okay. right? They, they do have proxies they work through, but they make money available. They create conditions. Um, they want everybody focused on the stock market so that people feel rich and will spend their income and go into debt. Okay, we need ever expanding debt. That's the game. Once you have that paradigm and you understand that all of the policies are designed to get people to go into debt, if you won't go into debt personally, your government will do it for you and then tax you. Okay, so there's no way to escape debt. The key is if you're going to be in this system, it's like being in an aquarium and deciding you don't want to be a fish. You have no choice. You're breathing the water, whether you like it or not. It's the ecosystem. You can say, well, I want to live debt free. You can't. Not in this system. This system is debt. If you're going to live in it, you got to go into debt. So it's easy to manipulate any market by because values, asset values in the stock market and in real estate are set by comparative sampling. And, you know, because Kenny's a professional investor and he focuses on income and he focuses on commercial properties that derive their value through income, it's not the same as the housing market where it can really get bubbly. So, so, but for people who don't understand that, if, if I, if, if there's, say, say there's an economy with a million dollars in it, the that's all of the money that exists, a million dollars. And in that economy, there are 10 homes and they are exactly 100% uniform. That's exactly the same. So on average, if you just divided the amount of money in the economy by the number of uh, houses, each house would be worth $100,000. But you know, in the current course of doing business, somebody in the economy ends up accumulating a couple hundred thousand dollars and they decide they want one of those houses and they bid for it and they get it for 200,000. There's enough money in the economy to pay the $200,000. And the person who sold it got the money and the person who bought it got the house. Okay. But the other nine people now through the appraisal, through the comparative, through the comps, all think their house is worth what? $200,000. And so now you've got 10 homes worth $200,000 on paper, but how much money is in the economy? That didn't change. It's still only a million dollars. So that million dollars of equity that shows up on everybody's balance sheet, makes them feel rich, is fake. It's air. And when everybody goes to sell, all the air comes out. And so in order to keep that game going, you have to keep people buying homes. How do you do that? You make lending available. So when I was in the mortgage business, the way the mortgage business works is I go originate a mortgage. I loan you two money so you can buy your dream home. And then I take that loan and all the other loans that I got, and I package them all up together, and I take them to Wall Street, and they buy them in bulk and give me back more cash so I can go make more loans. And I'm typically working off of a big HELOC you know, or a, a line of credit called a warehouse line of credit. And I'm using that to originate the loans, and then I get my tank refilled so I can go make more loans when I can sell that off to Wall Street. Those are mortgage-backed securities. And when there's not enough demand in the private sector for those bonds, the Fed steps in and buys them, keeping the bid up, keeping the interest rates down to stimulate the housing market. So they don't buy houses directly. They create an environment where people basically get money for free and they will go bid on the houses. And, and you continue to see the cap rates compress because as soon as the Fed establishes what the yield is in the market, all other asset classes react to it and they drop in yield and they increase in price. It's how you create asset bubbles. And that's the world we live in right now. Huge so that, asset yeah, so, bubbles everywhere. So that's exactly what's happening right now is they've done that. And the issue that they had is they usually had in their tool belt, the interest rate to be able to manipulate a little bit, you know? So let's say interest rates were four or five, they can bring them down to three. They can raise them up to six. So right now they've got over 6% inflation. They've got this bubble 
and they have ze almost zero percent interest rates. I mean, yeah. You can so if you can imagine that in order to keep the bond bubble from popping, you have to have continually lowering interest rates. And it's been going on for four decades since Paul Volcker. When you hit the zero bound, you can no longer take the interest rate down nominally. There's nowhere to go. You're at zero. So how do you create a real net negative? And that's the difference between nominal and real. So if I have a savings account paying me 1% and inflation is 2%, then my net yield on my savings is minus 1% because I'm losing 1% per year. Okay. So it's the same thing with a bond. If a bond is paying a face, you know, a coupon rate, a face rate of, of, of 1% and inflation is 1%, I'm even. If inflation is 2%, my not my real yield on that bond is minus one. If I if I need to lower interest rates and I've hit zero nominally, what do I need to do in order to have continually lower interest rates in the real world? I need to raise inflation. That's right. So this inflation is not an accident. They're doing it on purpose because they have to. And again, this is why they're desperate to reset the system because we've reached the end of this cycle. We, we reset, Volcker reset in, in, in 80, 21% prime rate or whatever it was. And it's been going down ever since. They hit the zero bound. They tried to get off the mat in 2016, raise it like 25 or 50 basis points. The market started having a conniption fit. They backed right up. And then when the coronavirus hit, then they went into this massive stimulation, which created even further falling real interest rates because interest rates went back to zero, but inflation went up, which means the real yield, the real interest rate went down. And how long can it go on? So do you see um, like the asset bubbles bursting? Like, you know, I always wonder, right? And a lot of our audience does too. You know, when's the stock bubble going to burst? We always get asked when's the real estate bubble going to burst? I mean, do you see them bursting in the near future or do you think they're just going to keep pumping and, inf you know, creating more inflation? Well, this is where we have to study currencies that actually fail. So a few years back, Venezuela's currency was collapsing. The year that their currency collapsed, their stock market, uh, it's called a crack up boom. Their stock market was a top performing stock market in the world. The problem is it was all denominated in boulevards and nobody wanted them. And that was why it was going up. Okay. So if, if we think of the world in terms of a, a dollar that, that is valuable, that is worth having, that is in demand, then you'd think, oh yeah, this thing has to burst because it's got to come back to earth. But if the dollar actually fails, it doesn't have to come to, back to earth denominated in dollars. Look at Zimbabwe, roll the toilet paper, it's like a trillion Zimbabwe dollars or whatever it is, it's ridiculous. So that those bubbles never burst in terms of nominal value, but in terms of real value, it did. And this is the concern. This is why it's really important. And we've been saying this for 10 years, ever since 2008. And we kind of came through the postmortem of that, that the, the best balance sheets are going to be insulated from the financial system. The best balance sheets are going to own things that are real and essential and affordable. And you, you started off, I think, earlier in the show talking about the idea of migration patterns. And I think that, that we're seeing that. And if you understand that, then people are going to gravitate uh, on the real estate side uh, to marketplaces, product niches, and uh, political and tax environments where they have a better chance of maintaining quality of life. That creates upward demand pressure uh, in, in, in certain markets while other markets are going to be losers. So with real estate, it's, uh, you know, I just, uh, yeah, 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 stocks can, stock market can, can bubble could burst, but it, it could not, it could burst the same way we can have deflation at the same time we have inflation. The value of the stock market could fall in terms of real value, but it could end up having the numbers be high. I mean, again, if I have a trillion dollars of stock and a and trillion dollars won't buy me a roll of toilet paper, how valuable is the stock re in the real world where it matters? Right. It's hard to get your mind around it, but I think Americans need to start thinking outside the dollar. Uh, doesn't mean it's going to collapse. Doesn't mean it's going to collapse tomorrow. Doesn't mean they won't save it. But I'm just thinking we're at, we're at a place where I think you need to be thinking about it. You need to be preparing for it. So let me ask you a question. So I, I had an opportunity to listen to Lynn Alden and George talk about the 1940s. And in, I studied the 1940s actually before this. So it was really interesting to me. And what happened after the war 
is, you know, we had this massive inflation, which we're starting to see now. And they, uh, we also had this big debt then be, to pay for the war. So we had, we had a lot of debt and we had high inflation. And so both of them were saying that this is very similar to what happened in the 40s. What happened was, is the U.S. was able to erase almost 40% of the debt through inflation. Um, have you looked at that period of time and, and, and calculated it as to where we are today at all? Um, I haven't. I would definitely defer to Lynn and George on that. Uh, I do know that there's so many dynamics um, that you have to be be careful. I, the, the concept of of uh, inflation making debt smaller, it's what we experience in real estate all day long, right? If I buy a house at $80,000 loan with $20,000 down, it's a $100,000 house. And you know it doubles in value in 10 years. Now I have a $200,000 house and $120,000 of equity versus uh, an eighty thousand dollar loan, so my debt shrunk because of inflation relative to my my balance sheet. It became a smaller portion of my balance sheet. That that's what real estate does. The same thing works in governments. You know, their balance sheet they have X amount of debt, and to make it go away, they inflate it, and that, that's a big part of the reason why we have an inflationary system because it lowers the burden on the debtors, and the government is the chief debtor of all. So there's a lot of motivation to do that. But the thing that we had in the 1940s is we had a very strong manufacturing base. So we produced a lot of real wealth. We had an extremely strong balance sheet because we ended up with most of the world's gold. That's how we ended up at Bretton Woods in 44 or 45, because we had 20 tons of gold. We were the big gorilla by a lot. All that gold was coming over here to buy our manufacturing capacity to feed the war effort. So even though we had a lot of debt, we also had a really, really strong balance sheet and really strong income. Well, that's no longer the case. Our balance sheet is terrible and our income really isn't that great. We're running trade deficits and we really don't produce anything. I mean, uh, I'm sure people watching this right now are receiving all kinds of shipments from Amazon and Christmas presents and whatnot, and you open everything up and where's it all made? China. It's all made in China. So it's a very different world today. I'm not so again. I, I I haven't listened through. I've heard George talk about it, but I haven't listened through it. But I would just say that you have to look at the entire, the entire scenario, the entire landscape when you start trying to make comparisons. And, and this is a very different world that it we're is, in today. It is. Uh, I want one last question. Um, I I was talking to George the other day because we we had a. T I was talking to him about what he was calling the euro dollar system. Yeah, and I didn't quite understand what it was. I just. So I just was trying to ask it a bunch of ways and he, and he explained it to me this way. He said, we are paying other people in U.S. dollars and they're taking U.S. dollars in return for whatever goods they give us. That's, those are called Euro dollars. And so he said um, a lot of times, like when he talks to Jeff Snyder and we talk about this M1, M2, which M2 is, they stopped reporting, as you know, like how much money is in currency is in, in, in supply. It doesn't matter, according to Jeff Snyder, because the euro dollar system and the euro dollars are so big, uh, they're outside of the United States. They're not even counted. Um, and, and so um, the, the, the point of, of all this is he was, uh, we start, we're starting to see countries like Russia and India stop taking U.S. dollars in exchange. I don't know if you saw those articles that came out in the last month. They literally are not going to take the U.S. dollars anymore. So other countries are starting to look at the U.S. dollar right now and say, you know, we're going to pass on taking dollars for what we're giving you. Um, what, what, do you what do you have to say about that? It's been going on a long time. And uh, I start. I did a talk on it at the New Orleans Investment Conference in 2013, and then I wrote a re follow-up report to it called the Real Asset Investing Report. And I believe at the Future of Money and Wealth Conference in 2016, Kenny, you came to. Um, we also talked further about it and chronicled the history uh, after 2008, uh, about 2009, I think it was, um, or maybe it was the end of 2000. It was the end of President Obama's term, and uh, the premier of China came over and publicly scolded the president of the United States over the management of the dollar because they were so invested in treasuries. And they knew that, it, you know, inflation 
destroys people who have saved. And that's effectively what the, the Chinese had done by purchasing U.S. bonds. And those bonds, they would get paid back in dollars that weren't as, worth as much as when they bought them. And so China, after that, in 2010, started engaging in what they call bilateral swap agreements with countries all over. And that meant rather than in international trade, rather than, you know, go into the dollar as an intermediary intermediate currency. In other words, if I want to buy oil from you and you're, you know, uh, a country that's allowed, it's your Saudi Arabia and, uh, and I'm in Turkey, uh, I would have to buy dollars and, and pay you. And the transaction would have to settle in dollars. And a lot of world trade was settled in dollars because it was the international currency. Bilateral swap agreements allowed the participants in these agreements to uh, bypass the dollar and the dollar system. And when they first started doing it, China was like, oh, no, 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 this has nothing. We still have faith in the dollar. We're not, you know, they tried to downplay it. Later, as you continue to look at the articles, they became more overt in their calls against de-dollarizing the, the world global system and getting away from the dollar. Russia clearly put their money where their mouth is. They sold all their treasuries and loaded up on gold. And now you're seeing people just overtly stop uh, working you know, in the dollars and dollar system. Uh, and they created infrastructure to parallel what the United States had. So the Asian Infrastructure Bank was created to uh, to be an alternative to the uh, uh, IMF, the International Monetary Fund. It was a way for the, the Eastern uh, countries to be able to lend money and solve their own problems without having going to the Western Central Bank system. Uh, you've seen, I can't remember what the name of it, but there's an alternative to the SWIFT system, which is how you do international wires. And, and so as the United States has continually weaponized the dollar, politicized the dollar, used the dollar system, which everybody is supposed to rely on as a piece of core infrastructure and international trade, and they've used it to manipulate and, and, and uh, enforce or reward and punish people based on the United States political uh, ambitions uh, and desires, you've seen people systematically try to find ways to get out of that system. The, 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 the Eastern countries stopped using, China especially, big, big gold trader, stopped using the Western uh, system the LBMA, the London Bullion and all that, they, they, they created the Shanghai Gold Exchange. So all these pieces of infrastructure have been set in place. This has been going on for, for a decade that I've been watching it. And so what's happening now is there's people like Ed Griffin who've been watching stuff going on for probably before I was born, you know, and then you've got people like Robert Kiyosaki who've been watching it since his time in Vietnam in the 70s. And then I kind of came along and woke up in the, the mid 90s. Uh, and you've got other people systematically waking up, but but these things, these are dynamics that have been going on for a long time. But the bottom, bottom line, <clears throat> excuse me, is the world is trying to get out from underneath the thumb of the US dollar. And they now have the manufacturing capability and the oil and energy production capability to pull it off, and they're doing it. So that that is actually the point, is everyone else is seeing this except... The you know, people in the U S and this is also part of the rise of the crypto, right? Very, you know, this is just one more piece of something that's been going on a long time. And that's what I want everyone to understand is the, the dollar has been devaluing. That's clear. And, and the rest of the world who's being paid in it is not happy. And that's why China pegged their dollar, if you remember. And that was all this controversy because they said, we're going to peg our dollar against the U.S. dollar so you can't devalue it. And so these little things have been happening and, and uh, people need to kind of wake up uh, uh, as to what's happening with their own dollars. And that's why Kiyosaki says savers are losers. This is what he meant. Not you're not personally a loser, but your savings is is going to lose on this inflationary track as they continue to print and buy bonds and do all these things, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely. The system is fragile, and when the credit markets collapse, like they did in 2008, if you're a guy like I was back then, where you know I didn't really have any cash on hand, I was fully deployed. Uh, I was relying on credit lines for my operating capital. I was relying upon my uh, credit uh, credit markets to be able to broker mortgages and generate an income. Uh, most of the things I was involved in involved developing things and selling things to people all using financing. And when that, all that disappeared, I was victimized. 
so it, it, you know, I think it's smart in an environment like this to have uh, to have liquidity outside the banking system and outside the dollar. That would be cryptocurrency and precious metals. Uh, not that I wouldn't have some dollars. I would have some of those too outside the system because the dollar could get stronger before it gets weaker because it's going to end up being the strongest place to the safest place to be on a sinking ship. If you can imagine the tip of the Titanic when it's going down, everybody bailed out of every other space and climbed into the top of the ship, but the ship was still sinking, right? There's going to be a lot of people that climb out of other failing currencies and climb into the dollar, but the ship's still going down. So if you have some stuff outside, if you own things that are real and essential and you have them structured so that it's not your your wealth isn't based on asset prices which could you know disappear as i mentioned earlier it's faux it's air equity happens and equity doesn't disappears right but if you have real cash flow and they change the currency you're still going to get 20 to 30% of whatever somebody's earnings is whether they denominated in dollars yuan sdrs puka shells banana peels it doesn't matter you've got something real and essential so things like energy things like uh housing things like um uh food th those those are real and essential those human needs don't go away an economy will will uh rise up and evolve somehow either through the leaders or through the people at the street level in, for people to meet their needs uh yeah sure you can operate within the banking system and you can have credit cards and you might want to have some stocks or whatever you know i would focus if you're going to do that on companies that actually have real businesses that sell real products and generate real profits as opposed to speculating and hoping that there's the greater fool theory somebody will come along and pay more uh, but I, I do think you just want to focus on having a strong balance sheet, strong income, and be invested in things that are real and essential, and just be watching. Because what will happen, I think, is is it, it's been happening slowly in the old Ernest Hemingway quote, you know, how did you go bankrupt? Well, kind of slowly at first and then all at once. Yeah, well, that's a great spot to end on. <laughs> wow, there's a lot there, guys. So obviously, um, for those of you who are confused, it's okay. Yeah, it was a lot to take in. Yeah, there's some things I'm going to have to look. Yeah, at. <laughs> yeah, just we're going to break this up, and 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 uh, you know, there's if you're confused, it's okay. I mean, we've been studying this stuff. I know you've been studying it longer than I have. I'm still confused on a number of topics, but it becomes clearer and clearer and clearer. And, and Russ, I know you guys have a ton of stuff on your website and you guys have incredible podcasts and YouTube and all that. Where can people reach you guys to, to dig more in on some of these topics? Well, I think that the easiest thing to do is just visit the website, realestateguysradio.com over my back shoulder, realestateguysradio.com. And I think that if this kind of conversation is like, hey, I, I really want to understand this, then the, the place to come is our summit. That's where we have guys like Ed Griffin and George Gammon and Kenny and, uh, you know, just all kinds of smart people. And we spend an entire week talking about this, unpacking it. it. It's too deep to have a casual conversation. This is like, this is like an appetizer here. So uh, if you go to realestateguysradio.com, click on the tab that says summit, uh, then you can learn all about that. And it's about 250, 280 people. Uh, we do it in Belize. It's a ton of fun. It's kind of like a vacation. If you're geeky into investing in economics, it's a great hang. You're going to be in a room full of all the right people. And we'd love to have you. Yeah, that's a great. And I, I, just to follow up on that, I've been to, gosh, how many do you think? Seven, seven eight. or eight at least. Yeah, I've been to seven or eight of these. And one of the things that obviously you guys bring in some great speakers, but the people who attend, because it's not cheap, this is not um, a, a small ticket. And I want to just say that. But the reason I say that is because the the people that are there, uh, they have means they, and they're concerned. They're concerned about their savings. They're concerned about their businesses. They're concerned about their investments. And obviously they're looking for answers just like all of us. I think it's a great group of folks. Um, and, um, you know, it's been, it's been fun to go to, hasn't it? Yep, definitely. Yeah. So Russ, thanks again, buddy. I appreciate that. I got, I wrote down a bunch of notes here of myself, of things I need to follow up on. And uh, as always, you're a great resource for the channel and I appreciate you. I appreciate being on and keep up the good work. I know you're making a difference out there and the world needs more, uh, good ideas and smart voices. So appreciate the yeah. opportunity. My pleasure. Okay, buddy. See we'll talk right. to you soon. Take care. See ya.